You're listening to Psych with Mike. For more episodes or to connect with the show with comments, ideas, or to be a guest, go to www.psychwithmike.com. Follow the show on Twitter at Psych with Mike or like the Facebook page at Psych with Mike. Now, here's Psych with Mike. Welcome to the Psych with Mike Library. This is Dr. Michael Mahan, and I'm here with Mr. Brett Newcomb. How are you? I'm doing very, very well. So, uh, what is your? I'm just confused and reality. perplexed. Why? Because I think you want to talk about new physics experiments, and I don't know I, anything about physics. Yeah, I, I don't. Oh. Um, I mean, Here's, this is me being relieved. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to talk about the actual experiment as much as the conclusion. It made my so, eyes glaze over when I tried to read it. Uh, I read an article that uh, reported the results of an experiment where they, through a quantum process, tried to define what is objective reality and what the experiment concluded is that objective reality didn't exist and so we, we don't we have come so far from cognito ergo sum why is that i think therefore i am no yeah, now yeah, you're yeah. telling me no there's no such thing as objective reality you think you think but you don't oh well but but no i think that that it makes that even more important i think therefore i am so i've told clients for all my entire career that reality is a myth the only thing that matters is your perception (laughs) right all is perception and i think that this experiment actually fortifies the argument of i think therefore i am because i think that that's all that you have is your thoughts your own perception so is the cat real well the, the question is is the cat alive or dead and the answer is he's both is until really you is it really alive? open the box, yeah, right. Right? right? And and that that was the whole purpose of and this is uh, an allusion to Schrodinger's cat, in which uh, this physicist named Schrodinger said, okay, if you put a cat in a box with a capsule of cyanide that is set to detonate randomly, and you close the box up. Then five minutes later, is the cat alive or dead? And the answer is you don't know until you open the box and observe it. And that is called in physics. That's called superposition. That and and again, I don't want to go Does into. Does your bear poop in the woods? What if you're not there? Yeah. Only if he's eating berries. Huh. But. Uh, it does if the tree falls, does it make noise? Yeah. You know, I mean, there's it's, all it's of these. Wrong. Yeah, there's all of these things, but the what the the experiment says is that the only thing that matters is what the individual's observation is. So the reality of the situation, even if you control for it still requires the observation of the individual. And so I think that this is relevant to us in that it supports this psychological argument that we've made all of our lives, which is the only thing that matters is your own perception. Well, there's a science fiction novel that had some exposure uh, years back by Robert Heinlein, called Stranger in a Strange yeah. Land. Yeah, And in that novel, there is a an official witness for the legal process. Mm-hmm. And you can always have you pay to have an official witness, and it's better than photographic evidence because they're trained, and they never forget, and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, the official witness is trained. You say, well, what color is that house across the street? They don't look at it and go, it's a blue house. They say, this side of the house is blue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they don't make assumptions about yeah, anything else. Right. Well, the one thing that we've always talked about, or at least that I've always said, is, you know, I don't know what happened in your home. I haven't seen a videotape of it. But we've seen recently lots of videotapes come to light in this whole police kind of brutality argument. And even when the videotape is made public, there are 15 different interpretations. Yeah. So even videotape 
isn't a guarantee of objective reality. So right. the, the, in the end, there just is no such thing. We have to accept either in our personal lives, in our relationships with other people, but also as a function of society, there is no objective reality. So there are only the experiences and the interpretations of the individuals, but then that makes it even more important for all of us to be able to have some type of civil dialogue and say, this is my impression, right? So uh. the couple has to be able to say, my feeling was when you said that to me, I was hurt. And I have to say that to you. That may not have been your intention, but that was what happened. I can't assume that you should, well, you should know that what you said was hurtful to me, right? Yeah. There is no objective reality. There's right. only our interpretation. And we have to be able to express ourselves. Well, in doing marriage counseling, we talk all the time about assumptive communication. Exactly. And the damage that that can do in a relationship. Right. So I think you're just extrapolating that out to a larger field. Mm -hmm. And so if there is no objective reality, and I feel like that in the uh, other pods that we've taped today, we've kind of been brushing up against this several times, this idea of then how do we agree? How can we agree about anything if there is no objective reality? And the truth is the only way that that happens is if what I think matters to you. Hmm. So can I leverage that? Well, you could, yes, you could use it very manipulative, but the counter to that is if you don't care about what I think, then it doesn't matter to you, which is where we are in so many of our realities as a society, if you don't care about what I think about the vaccine, then it doesn't matter to you. If you don't care about what I think about the evacuation of Afghanistan, then it doesn't matter to you. And so then you can have whatever opinion you want, and we may not be able to have a civil dialogue. Maybe I just care about what I can get you to do or not do. And well, about what you think. And, and I'm sure that everything ultimately, yes, comes down to a manipulation and what the individual thinks is best for them. But what I'm saying is, or, or what I am trying to envision is, is there a way, not just for us as couples. So I'm assuming that if we're a couple, we have some invested interest in trying to understand each other. Is there a larger... Well, yeah, members of a larger community. Yeah. Neighbors. Right. Uh, members of the same church, mm -hmm. uh, same political organization, same club, same social group, whatever it might be. If we find common ground, commonality, mm -hmm. then there's a greater chance that it matters. Right. Or, or well, so, but the commonality doesn't well, have to it be... It goes back to the whole thing about uh, uh, if I... If I know you, and I read in the paper today that you were killed in a car wreck, mm -hmm. I'm really struck by that. Mm -hmm. it, it has an impact on me. But if I pick up the paper and say, a thousand people in China were right. killed in a flood, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but it has no impact on me. Right. Because it's not real to me. Exactly. And so is there any way for us as a society to try and get to a place where we do care? Right. Where it doesn't matter whether you're on the pro-life or pro-choice side of the debate that you could actually care about what people on the other side think and feel. Is there a way to do that? So this is a concept. And it doesn't have to be about that particular issue. Right. No, I know that. Yeah. Uh, but again, if we're doing a podcast for people that want to do therapy. Mm -hmm. Are people that are going to therapy who want to understand right. what they should be looking for or understanding. The uh, issue here is not just philosophical. Mm -hmm. the, the issue is how is your satisfaction level with your life mm -hmm. playing out? And one of the critical ingredients, we believe, is empathy and compassion and connectivity to others. Mm -hmm. The immersion of you in a community of some kind of... Uh, like feeling, like thinking individuals. And so in other podcasts, we talk about the historical development of mankind 
from you know family, clan, tribe, mm-hmm. nation, and up the up the food chain. You're brought from Buner, and, and we're trying to go back mm-hmm. and say, break it back down into connectivity with other human beings, and some of that, as we've discussed in other podcasts today, has to do with your your theory of cognition, mm-hmm. how you understand social cognition and social interaction, but some of it has to do with this sort of thing. What, what's ultimately and objectively and measurably and provably true? But it also has to do with another issue that we've discussed, which is the difference between responsibility and victim script. So if you only live in the victim script where everything is being done to you right. and you have to defend yourself against the man trying to put his thumb on you, then you're not taking any responsibility for what you could do or what you could invest in to try and make the situation better. Right. When when I'm doing uh, couples therapy, I oftentimes refer to the book, The Languages of Love, the love language, I think it's the five love languages, but uh, regardless. um, And what is amazing to me is how many people get introduced to that book and they read through it and they say, oh, my love language is acts of service. I'm like, that's not the point. It doesn't matter what your love language is. The point is, what is your partner's love language and do you ever try and communicate to them through their love language? Because if my love language, me, Michael, is acts of service, but my wife's love language is time together. It doesn't matter how many dishes I wash. Right. She doesn't hear it because right. I'm not speaking her love language. And I think that that's something that we've lost in our civil well, discourse. Yeah, I would work with clients in, in a similar conversation to say, ask her what behavior or words mm-hmm. you can use that she hears you saying, I love you. Right. You matter to me. Right. Because it doesn't matter what you think you're saying. Well, I, I said I loved her. Mm-hmm. Well, how did you do that? Well, I brought her roses. Mm-hmm. She says, I exactly. don't care about flowers. I never wanted flowers. And he's like, well, I never knew that. Mm-hmm. Well, what could he bring you that says, I love you? What could or he do? Or what could he say? Or say yeah, I'm, I'm getting there. Uh, but the, the challenge is getting the mm-hmm. family to hear that and, and not be defensive, not feel attacked. You know, I did something wrong. I screwed up. Oh, I'm always messing up. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're saying. Right. What we're saying is you're speaking Russian and she only understands German. Right. You know, can you find a common language and speak that language? And even within the domains of those five love languages, like words of affirmation. Yeah. You know, uh, I know that I've had conversations with women and they tell me, you know, well, he can say I'm hot and I don't like that. That makes me feel like an object. I want him to say I'm pretty or I look yeah. beautiful. Right. And so it's not even just, oh, I'm speaking the right language. It's also using the right words. Exactly. Yeah. And and you have to care about what that other person thinks for that to matter to you. If you don't care, then you're never going to make the effort. Well, it comes back again to all behaviors are in service of the self. Exactly. Be selfish here. Yeah. What do you want mm-hmm. her response to you to be? How are you best likely to get it? Mm-hmm. And sometimes it means I have to mop the floor. Sometimes mm-hmm. it means I have to go to the chick flicks. Sometimes it means she has to go to the baseball game. And it will negotiate those things. But at the end of the day, are we hearing in our own language, what we need to hear so that we feel safe. And, you know, I would have this conversation with couples and say to the guy, do you hear her saying that when you say, oh, you look really hot, that that isn't something that makes her feel good. She would like it presented. It's not that hard to do what she's asking, but you just have to get out of your own perceptual reality and try and see well, it, it. It may be that hard. It's easy for you to say that. Oh, it's not that hard. Come on, just say these words. I remember a, a client that I had who had a teenage daughter who was cutting and struggling mm-hmm. and, and in serious emotional trouble. And 
I had a conversation with him to say, your daughter needs to hear you say, mm -hmm. I care about you, mm -hmm. I love you, come let me hold you. And the man looked at me and said, I don't talk that way. Mm -hmm. I said, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. And your daughter needs you to talk that way. Are you willing to make that effort to help her be less in pain? Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, I don't know. I said, well, that is the critical mm -hmm. question. You know, part of his attitude was she needs to suck it up. She needs mm -hmm. to just get through it and get over it. It's irrational thought on her part. Uh, she's not in reality. I mean, it doesn't matter. She's in pain. Mm -hmm. And as her father, you are paying me to help you find a way to have her not be in pain. And I'm telling you the way. Well, and, and he's saying, oh, she's not living in reality. Well, whose reality? Yeah. She's not living in your reality. Exactly. And that's the whole point of this article today is there is no objective reality give up your own selfish need to force everybody to perceive reality through your perceptual organs your fantasy of being in control yeah yeah because you're not okay, okay uh let's take our break and we'll come back and we'll talk more about this okay so one of the reasons that i want to participate in this show is because it gives me an opportunity to clinically review my understanding of what therapy is and how it works, especially for the consumer. Mm -hmm. So my hope is that we will find conversations that broaden my understanding of that. And my hope is that we do that in a way that is useful, but also entertaining for people so that they want to listen, not only because they're getting good psychology information, but because they just enjoy the show. Easy listening with an informational twist. So That's a new not, tagline. They're not sitting there going, huh? Easy listening with an informational twist. I'm really good at it. I'm a professional. You're here. a professional. If it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike. So uh, I had a client who said to me in front of his family, my kids, my male children don't want me to hug them. Yeah. With his male children sitting in the room saying, all we want is for you to hug us. And, and I mean, that is the depth of what we're talking about is, you know, sometimes even when you are being presented with the opposite argument, what does it take for you to be able to break down your own need, as you say, to be in control, to be able to accept what this reality is from another perspective? So as a clinician in that moment, how do you handle it? Yeah, well, I mean, I say, can you hear them saying these things and the question is what is the response now in this situation you know the, the we didn't hammer this because it was clear that this was emotionally a, 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 a challenge point right and so you have, but Mike, here's you the have thing. to handle it no 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 but, but, but you can either as a clinician yeah you have to be able to recognize if i push this am i going to get a breakthrough or am I just going to break this person? Right. And there's no value in breaking oh, no, no, no. the person. It's not confrontational. Right. It's not argumentative. Right. It's not power driven. It's about compassion right. and feeling and safety. Right. And so you have to put yourself in the middle of it as a clinician, I believe. And you have to say, well, Tom, I hear you saying that. And when you say it, I hear a lot of pain and anguish mm -hmm. in your voice. It, it seems to matter to you mm -hmm. that your understanding is your boys don't want you to hug them. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about that? Can mm -hmm. you explain it so that I understand it accurately? Am I hearing you correctly? Mm -hmm. So you, you work that piece with Tom. Then you turn to the sons and say, boys, you've just heard your father mm -hmm. say this. Uh, can each of you tell me what you heard and what you felt? And then ask Tom, Tom, did, did he hear you? Mm -hmm. Did Joe hear you? Did mm -hmm. Bill hear you? Mm -hmm. And what do you need to hear from Joe or Bill now? Yeah. And, and what I said to the guy was, I hear your children yeah. saying that they do want this. Yeah, I hear and I different. wonder right. what it Where's would take for you to be able to hear that also. Okay. Uh, I think you can get there from that. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the, the, 
goal, at least for me, the goal is to try and understand from both individuals what is the blockage, right? I was talking to, uh, in, in my class this semester, one of the, the icebreakers that I put, because we're online still, and one of the icebreakers that I put is, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite number? What do you think this says about you? And, you know, people are saying, oh, I don't think colors or numbers say anything about me. And I, you know, my response to that is, the thing isn't important, but the reason for the thing is. So, it doesn't matter whether your favorite color is blue or red, but the reason why you like blue or red is important, right? And so trying to understand if we have people who are blocked, who can't hear each other, what I'm trying to get to is what is the reason that it is difficult for them to be able to communicate effectively. Yeah, and clinically, one of the ways you approach doing that, if it's that severe a block and it presents itself in the room, is you have to offer yourself as the intermediary. Mm -hmm. You have to say, okay, Tom, I hear what you're saying. Your boys are sitting here. They hear what you're saying. There's still an enormous amount of tension Mm -hmm. in the room. Can we work through me Mm -hmm. as the depository of the messages right can can you give that to me to hold knowing that they've heard it knowing that i will talk it through with them and i'll turn and ask them if they can ask me to hold their messages can Mm -hmm. i serve that function as intermediary until we can nibble away at whatever the source of the tension is or the animosity or the hostility the hurt and try to find ways to make it go away Mm -hmm. we just keep coming back we just keep working the piece Because I'm not going to attack you. I'm not going to say, you're right, he's wrong, he did it, you didn't. That's not what we do in therapy. Mm -hmm. What we try to do is hear accurately and get you both or all of you to the place that you don't feel hurt, resentful, angry, Mm -hmm. deprived, whatever. Mm -hmm. And that means you're going to have to trust me. Mm -hmm. And you trust me to hear you accurately and hold it in that space until you don't need it anymore. Yeah. And and so the way that I went about handling that, I'll I'll elucidate that by sure. telling a different story. So people always say to me, uh, not always, but frequently say, what do you do if somebody's schizophrenic? The first thing I say is, well, the probability of seeing somebody who is really that severely pathologic uh, in a, a, a private practice is fairly rare because people, when that happens, generally end up in a hospital. But I have had a handful of situations where people were delusional in the context of therapy. And I had a guy one time who was really schizophrenic and I was trying to promote this and his psychiatrist was not willing to hear it his family was not willing to hear it schizophrenic oh yeah yeah and and but he was coming to my office talking about you know being chased around by the uh, you know guys in black sedans and he came to my office one day saying that he had been you know chased there by black helicopters and uh he said don't you see him and i said i do not because people say well what do you do do you do you do you buy into their delude i say no you don't buy into their delusion but you also don't challenge the delusion and so what i said to him was i don't see the black helicopters but i certainly understand that if you see those black helicopters that that is incredibly frightening and i'd like to talk to you about how you feel about that and in the same way i would say to this guy i certainly can appreciate how hearing this message from your children and it being in conflict with what you believe that that could be very difficult that could be even feel like it is scary and i wonder if we could talk about how that feels for you i want to get at the feeling and try and process the feeling to see if we can come to a different conclusion. Absolutely. I don't disagree with you at all. I think when what I tell my students 
is always when you get lost, when you get overwhelmed, mm. when everything swarms on you mm-hmm. in session, step back and yeah. do process awareness. Yeah. Process awareness is when the clinician describes for the room, here's what I am mm-hmm. aware of. This is what my perception is right now. Now, can I get some feedback whether other people experience it the way I do or if I'm off base? And, and if I'm off base, can you explain to me what I'm misunderstanding? And so you always offer yourself mm-hmm. as the person who's wrong. Yeah, absolutely. You don't ever point to somebody else and say, you're wrong. So, but, you, but you have to have a way to do that that makes it safe for them or encouraging to them to open up and explain to you what, mm-hmm. they, what they see, what they feel. And, and you, you don't go, oh, yeah, huh, mm-hmm. and you don't let them attack each other. You say, well, I want to hear what Brenda has to say because it matters to me that I understand Brenda accurately. And what she's telling me is that I don't. Mm-hmm. So I want to hear more. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so you don't take sides. You don't do rights or wrongs. But you offer yourself as the repository of all mm-hmm. those feelings. And another thing that I do in situations like this is to try and find you know, when you were doing, going to school and you were learning how to do math and they always talked about trying to find the lowest common denominator. Uh-huh. I always try and that's what I think of whenever I have a situation like this. And I always try and find what is the smallest, even if it's minuscule, what is the smallest piece of information that we can both agree on? So can we both agree that we are in a loving situation can we both agree that we want to be together what's the smallest factor upon which we can both agree and then if we can figure out what that is can we build on that okay if we agree that we both love each other then can we also agree that we want to try and engage in behaviors that elicit love and good feeling from our partner i Intellectually agree with you. Yeah. But as a client, I would really balk at that approach um, because it sounds manipulative to me. Mm-hmm. I, I think mm-hmm. that the challenge is how are you going to make me safe enough to take my defenses down so that I'm not resisting? How do you help me not resist? So then you don't feel like that trying to find something that we agree on would would break that down? You feel like that that would, would put I, more I think, walls up? I, I think for me personally, yeah, yeah. it would be a problem because mm-hmm. I would be playing games with you then. I'd be debating how many angels can dance on the head of a pen mm-hmm. instead of being in touch with my feelings, instead mm-hmm. of being in touch with my emotional reality. And maybe I'm not able to be at this point, but mm-hmm. that's your job to recognize I mm-hmm. can't go there mm-hmm. and, and find a way to invite me to go there. Right. So I'm just telling you, for me, yeah, yeah, no, no. I'd be oppositional yeah. as hell. Yeah, and 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 certainly... I, I think you're one hundred percent correct. It's the therapist's job to be able to yeah. rate that resistance and know where you can but not by push them to a breakthrough and not push them to be broken. About it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's gotta yeah. be invitational, it's gotta yeah. be safe. Yeah. Uh uh but I'm wondering, so uh why for you does that feel like that would put up more walls? Because and and I hear you saying that it feels manipulative, yeah. but because so what I'm wondering is, does it does it feel like something that tries to break through that wall and get to the feeling, or does it feel? Because my hope would be that people would not okay. experience me as manipulative. No, I, I think my reaction to that is that it invites me to stay in my head and think about things. Oh, rather and than I need process to be in touch the emotion. With my feelings. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. No, I think intellectually it's a great place to go and an accurate understanding. I just think for me as a client, I would be resistant because mm-hmm. I'd still be in my head. Mm-hmm. And so... And I don't think I'm going to make progress. That way. I'm not going to think my way out of this problem. Right, but if the client is resistant yeah. to being in their emotions yeah. anyway, yeah. what do you do to try and... I mean, I understand that you create would, the safe would, holding environment. Again, do the processing in the moment. You need to breathe. You need, can you just sit here? Mm-hmm. It's okay. Let's just take a breath. Let's just sit with this for a moment and see what presents. So itself. you might not even try and tell them, okay, I want you to be in your feelings. You would just do the process awareness yeah. Yeah. and That's how let I would them approach it. Yeah, and let them essentially and, and I would do stew reflect, reflective in it. listening. 
Yeah. It seems to me that your breathing is really tight and mm -hmm. shallow. I wonder if you could take a deeper breath. Mm -hmm. Could you take four deep breaths and not be talking about anything? Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that there's a disconnection in your eyes, that, that you're not making eye contact right now. It feels like you've gone away somewhere. Am I wrong? Do I understand that correctly? Am I hearing you accurately? Well, I'm not saying anything. Okay. Well, what I'm trying to tell you is that non-verbally, I'm mm -hmm. hearing something I don't know how to understand. So could you help me with that? Could you sit with it for a minute and let me get clarity? You know, do something like that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if, let's assume for the sake of argument sure. that we were doing either couples or family therapy. Okay. So while you are doing processing that with the one person, what do you want going on with everybody else? Do you want, because you don't want them to go off in their well, own little world. Well, that's one of the real challenges yeah. of having multiple clients. Well, that's why I'm you pointing watch that out. Yeah. Uh, I would probably say, again, offering myself as the person that's in the wrong, that I'm aware that I may not be perceiving you correctly. Mm -hmm. Is it all right with you if I ask these other people? Mm -hmm. If to I'm try and keep you, them engaged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, or can I ask how they're perceiving and what they're, and, and you've got to be careful because especially in couples dynamics or family dynamics, somebody's going to jump in as your assistant. Mm -hmm. Yo, you nailed him, boy. And that's not what it's about. And mm -hmm. you can't indulge that. You, so you have to make it be between you and that other person. Let me ask you, Joey, am I hearing you correctly? Mm -hmm. Do you perceive me as hearing your father correctly? Well, yeah, you're hearing me, but you're not hearing him. But I think, well, so for me, if we're just talking about uh, trying to be elucidating for people who might be doing therapy, right. I think that it can become easy and comfortable to connect with the person that you feel a connection with. Yeah. So you could connect with the wife or the husband and then focus on them. And then the other person is going to feel left out yeah. and you have to be able to monitor the room yes, and I you've agree. got to be able to know when the partner is feeling their limit and you've got to be able to re-engage them, even if you feel like what you're doing with the other person is, is important. really important yeah. and is productive. Yeah. You got to be able to keep that other well, we've, person we've engaged. All had to or do that. You, you turn to the other person, mm -hmm. you, or you, the person you're working with, and you say, "All of a sudden, I'm I'm really aware of so and so. Mm -hmm. Can I check in with them for a minute?" Mm -hmm. And you go to so and so, and you say, "What am I getting from you? I don't know because I was focused over here." How are you? Where mm -hmm. are you? What's going on with you? And so, and so you just work the piece. Yeah. But that's the whole process of awareness thing. Right. And it can sometimes feel counterproductive to do that yeah, because like, you think you're today? doing yeah. such great work with yeah. this other person. But you gotta you gotta you, you gotta do that it's, because it's not about your epiphany. Exactly. It's about theirs. Well, or even if it is about theirs, if you lose the wife because you're working with the husband, you're not doing yourself any favors. You're not doing the couple any favors. Yes, I agree. Okay. Hopefully that was good for people. As always, if you have any comments or anything that you would like to say to us or suggest uh, a topic for us to discuss, you can get us at psychwithmike.com. As always, go on the YouTubes and subscribe to the show there if you haven't already done that. The music that appears in Psych with Mike is written and performed by Mr. Benjamin DeClue. And as always, if it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike.